You're listening to the Uncensored Direct Marketing Show. This show is designed for direct response marketers who want raw, unfiltered conversion tips and secrets to scale their offers profitably to reach their next million. I'm Maria Sparagas. I'm the founder of Direct Paint It and your host. Now let's dive in. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Uncensored Direct Marketing. Today, I have a very special guest. His name is Zach Harvey. Uh, Zach is the owner and the founder of Lamasu. They make Bitcoin ATMs. Uh, Zach and I met, I believe, in 2013 uh, or maybe 2012 or maybe 2014, somewhere around around those years. Uh, and we met at a, at a Bitcoin trade show uh, in London, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was, you know, it was the Wild West in terms of crypto back then. Um, just everybody kind of getting into the scene, uh, a lot of just very techie, nerdy people not really knowing just what, what's going to happen to this. So it was a pretty interesting meeting. And after so many years, I'm happy to uh, to invite you, Zach, as my guest and to talk to our audience a little bit about crypto and your experience. Um, can you tell us a couple of things about your journey, like what brought you to become uh, the king of Bitcoin ATM uh, making? <laughs> sure, Absolutely. So uh, when I first encountered Bitcoin, I was in Israel and my brother and I actually had a guitar store, which is completely unrelated to cryptocurrencies. But we had started becoming libertarian at that point. And we're just fooling around with all kinds of ideas of, and, and one of them was this decentralized marketplace. And that's when we started discussing money. It's like, well, we can't use this kind of money on this decentralized marketplace because regular money isn't decentralized. And so we started looking at, at all these different options and there was one called Ripple that is not the same Ripple as today, but it was a different kind of transaction platform, but not actually a currency. And one of the ideas was also Bitcoin. But we, you know, looked it up, looked a little weird to us and kind of dismissed it because like nobody's ever going to use that. That's just crazy. You know, we can't launch this idea of ours with something that nobody will use. So we forgot about it for a while, but it was a, but, the, but the seed had already been planted. So when our other libertarian friends started bringing it up again, we started paying attention. And then sometime, I think in 2011, uh, we actually started offering to uh, sell our guitar gear for Bitcoin at our store, being the first store in Israel to accept Bitcoin. Oh, wow. Fortunately, not even one person bought a pack of strings of Bitcoin. There was no interest whatsoever. And so that was just for the just for the hell of it. And then um, for different reasons, we decided to close the guitar store and my brother and I moved to the US to New Hampshire. Um, and we kind of, we, we joined what was called the Free State Project, which is kind of a, uh, it's, it's a group of libertarians that got together and moved to the most libertarian state, which is New Hampshire. And there everybody started getting excited about Bitcoin. And there were these different conferences and festivals where we met a lot of people that are already doing stuff in Bitcoin. So, so, so I was, I already started getting really jealous that people actually had like Bitcoin businesses and all. And so that's how, that's basically how I got into crypto. As far as the ATMs, it wasn't really something that was, that was planned as such as, Hey, let's start a business that sells Bitcoin ATMs. Really, we were just going around to different student conferences and, and just talking about Bitcoin and, um, evangelizing Bitcoin to, to young students. And we wanted to bring something to really demonstrate it. So we built this kind of orange wooden box that was a Bitcoin ATM with no idea of making it anything commercial, just, just in order to demonstrate that wow moment of Bitcoin. And the first conference we brought it to, people just went crazy. And it started getting on social media. We even started getting emails from investors. And we're like, okay, let's drop everything and get into this. This is cool. And so that's that's how Lamasu Bitcoin ATM started. Oh, cool. And and why is it called Lamasu? What, what's the name, the origin of the name? So Lamasu is an Assyrian deity that it's, it's a protector of households. OK. And we really thought that that was that was cool for Bitcoin, like Bitcoin, the savior. Nice, nice. So, I mean, it's interesting, um, you know, you're talking about Bitcoin ATMs and so forth. So most people, when they buy Bitcoin, you know, we have Coinbase, which, you know, now is public. It's a very big, mm -hmm. um, very big company and so forth. And most people are buying through an exchange. Uh, why Why did you decide to start an, a physical ATM business? And what what are the advantages or what's the why would somebody use a, a Bitcoin ATM versus an exchange? 
Right. So an exchange has has all kinds of different levels and layers of, of operation. And they're, of course, very centralized, which means that in Coinbase's case, they had to get licenses from all 50 states and from the U.S. to, to operate there properly and needed a lot more startup costs. And they needed to take that responsibility and risk as well. And since we just kind of started it and bootstrapped it, we didn't want to really handle any of that stuff. So what we said is, we're only going to make these machines, we're going to develop the software, and then every operator, wherever they are, can see what the relevant jurisdiction is. We don't have to think of everything all at once. And we also liked the idea that this operation would be more decentralized, meaning that if something happened to, well, one of the, re, one of the things we did is we made the software open source, so that even if for whatever reason we couldn't manufacture these machines anymore, you would still be able to operate them. And earlier on, that was probably more important in our minds to do something like that because there was so much uncertainty and we never knew what would happen the next day. And so it's not that you shouldn't, you know, that exchanges aren't important and Bitcoin ATMs are, they're just different use cases and it makes sense for different people. For example, it may be very hard for somebody to say, hey, I want to start an exchange in the US if they want to start a business. But starting a Bitcoin ATM business is a lot easier. Okay. Interesting. So, I mean, the interesting thing about the the Bitcoin ATMs is also, um, you know, in an exchange, a lot of people are buying coins and they're storing them there. So it kind mm-hmm. of brings that centralization, I guess I would call it. Exactly. Um, you know, you're, you're still kind of like working with a quote unquote bank, you know, that's holding. Whereas mm-hmm. if you're buying it through an ATM, you are now completely decentralized you're buying it you're storing it you're um, right. you know you're you're basically the master of your 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 bitcoin or your crypto or right. whatever, yeah, whatever you're buying. that's a that's a great point it's so when you use a bitcoin atm it's non-custodial the yeah. bitcoin atm operator never holds on to your bitcoins you put in the cash and they immediately on, on the spot they send you the bitcoins Awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's interesting. And, um, you know, maybe we'll, we'll get a link from you and, and mm-hmm. uh, we'll show people how, how the Bitcoin ATM works. I'm sure you guys have a couple Absolutely. of demos Absolutely. We'd be there. happy to. Yeah. 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 So, well, there's one other very big point is that with Bitcoin ATMs, the payment is in cash. Okay. And so you don't have to go through your bank account. If you have issues with your bank account, your bank, you don't want your bank account to know that you're buying cryptocurrency because you're concerned they may freeze your account or, or tell you to look for another bank you can just do it in cash without going through any banking system. So that's good, not only for the US where it may be an issue to an extent, but other countries where it's definitely an issue. And and it's becoming more and more common that banks just tell you, hey, listen, I've seen you've made a Bitcoin transaction. We're no longer interested in working with you anymore. So that's another big advantage because cash is actually, in a sense, the decentralized form of, of fiat. Well, it's not really decentralized to the, to the extent that it's created in a decentralized manner, but to the fact that you can take a dollar bill and give it to someone directly without any middleman. Yeah. Well, I mean, I do agree that it is uh, cash is, you know, the equivalent, there's digital cash and then there's, um, you know, physical cash. And when you have whatever you can do with physical cash, you should be able to do with, you know, uh, electronic means, which is what the goal of Bitcoin and crypto is and so forth. So, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the government or whoever shouldn't be telling you what to do. And, and, you know, one thing I wanted to clarify um, about the point that you mentioned is that, you know, although uh, people are buying crypto with cash, it doesn't mean that they're doing something illegal. It doesn't mean that they're uh, hiding something, but it was yeah. up and I think now there's a little bit more kind of uh, mainstream investment in crypto and it's a little bit better. Uh, but up until a certain point, maybe even last year, if you did anything that kind of smelled a little bit crypto in a first world country, US, Canada, you know, uh, some of the bigger, more prominent European countries, you're, you you were subject to scrutiny, to, to uh, mm-hmm. background checks, to potentially losing your bank accounts and so forth. And you're like, well, I'm just going to make an investment. Why can I not invest my money where I want to invest it? So um, I think that's, you know, that's an interesting point about the Bitcoin ATMs that um, it, it's, you know, there's no, the, the stigma of like, oh, well, I'm, I'm paying cash for something or whatever. It doesn't mean that you're doing anything wrong. You're just no, of course uh, not. trying to avoid answering a lot of questions that you shouldn't be answering anyway, right? Because you're buying what you want, so. Exactly. Yeah. It's just, it's a lot more direct without involving nosy bankers. Yes. <laughs> um, so, I mean, in terms of, you know, we're talking about the different countries um, that you guys operate in and just crypto in general. Do you find that, um, you know, in the last year or so that 
the growth has really come from first world countries. Like what, what are your thoughts on like emerging markets and crypto and actually using crypto and emerging markets for things like payments or making people's lives easier for trade? Yeah, so uh, specifically for Bitcoin ATMs, we still see mo most of our markets are still first world. So North America is by far our biggest market. Um, we're very prominent in Canada as well. And um, and other than that, you know, we have machines scattered in Europe, scattered in Asia. We have some in Israel and we get orders from all over. We have some in Bulgaria as well. And so uh, the biggest market for us is North America. We, ha we have not yet seen a lot of orders from emerging markets. Okay. And so to be honest with you, I don't know if the reason for that is that our machines are just too expensive or that the need for Bitcoin ATMs isn't there yet, or they haven't discovered that there's a need for it yet. Yeah. Um, some exceptions might be places like, um, like Colombia and Venezuela, where we don't have a lot of machines, but we're starting to see that, there's a, that there is more interest and there are more Bitcoin ATMs there in general and for their, for their intended use case. Okay. So, I mean, I guess those are interesting countries, especially Venezuela with the inflation and, and kind of things going a little bit crazy uh, on the monetary mm -hmm. side with the government. So people are starting to flock a little bit to some, to, to an alternative and so forth. And maybe it'll be their, their, their currency, you know, at some point, cause it's, it's probably, um, you know, a safer bet than Venezuelan currency. That's for sure. Oh, that, that's for sure. Yes. Do you find, I mean, this is, you know, anecdotal because obviously, you know, this is not necessarily your specialty. You guys do ATMs and so forth, but do you find in emerging markets or from what you hear and because you're so involved in this circle, is it, is it starting to become a form of exchange in emerging markets and maybe not third world countries, but like second world, like maybe Bulgaria and kind of Eastern Europe countries? No, not that I've seen. I mean, as far as payments are concerned, I really haven't seen any evidence of, of cryptocurrency payments anywhere. Okay. I have. It's not something I've heard of. It's something that if you would have asked me in 2013, I would have expected it to happen at this point. Nice. But the interest for, I would say the, the global interest for cryptocurrency payments just doesn't seem to be there yet. Interesting. So that, that brings me to, to my next question. I'm curious now that you, you kind of said that, you know, payments versus store of value, um, you know, and, and especially like when we met in 2012 and 2013, those early years, people were really like that the, the debate of like, no, this is used for a payment mechanism. Blockchain is going to be used for, you know, to facilitate B2B payments, big, large payments. We won't need wires. We won't need this. We won't need that. And then other people were like, no, 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 this is, you know, gold 2.0. This is store of value and so forth. So, I mean, I right. personally think that we're, we're kind of headed to the gold 2.0, um, you know, route. But do you think that, you know, soon enough, there's going to be some influence in payments, maybe, you know, via ATMs, you can pay your bills or you can do something like that. Or do you still think mm -hmm. that it's, you know, for the foreseeable future, let's say the next couple of years, we're still going to see crypto as a store of value? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that uh, there are a few things that there are a few things going on. One, I think that the emergency use case for cryptocurrencies right now is store of value. It is kind of like, I don't know what's happening with this fiat stuff. I don't know what's happening with the, with the current legacy financial institutions, but I know it's scary and there, there's hardly anything else to invest in anyway that I'd feel good about. And then, so people see crypto going up and it kind of, I think you're going to start seeing things fold into crypto, whatever, you know, all of cryptocurrencies and crypto assets over time, I think are, are kind of going to suck up the old world. And then the payment thing may have to follow that. So whereas originally I thought it would be the other way around, yeah. but I like just a cute anecdote. Um, do you remember when Overstock, this was, I think, 2013, yes. Overstock announced that they were going to accept Bitcoin. And the first week or two, their biggest market was New Hampshire. Because everybody just got so excited and was like, I bought a bunch of towels, you know, from, <laughs> and using Bitcoin that I didn't even really need. I just thought it was super awesome. And so originally, that's what we thought how things were going to happen is that everybody accepts Bitcoin and then Bitcoin becomes popular. But that's that's not what happened in the end. And part of that may have been because of of Bitcoin fees going up so high. Mm hmm. But on the other hand, it might just be there's just not enough demand. Everybody's fine with with fiat payments right now. That's not the big issue. The big issue is fiat store of value. And so because that's the more important issue, that's the one worth focusing on right now. And I think that's what all of the companies and developer, developers in the cryptocurrency world have been focusing more on that. 
as replacing the things that that have the most interest and the most need from the user side. And from, I mean, if you want to call them customers, I guess users would be more accurate. For sure. Well, I mean, on from the payments angle, obviously, I have I have a couple of things uh, more to kind of add to that, just because I'm obviously in the payment space, we work in high risk payments and so forth. And what I see is that cryptocurrency um, and crypto payments in general blockchain really benefits merchants. But for the customer actually buying it, it's like, what's in it for me? Why, mm -hmm. why do I care that you, you can't return a payment? So what happens if I buy this from you and I don't like it, am I going to now have to fight to get my money back? So obviously credit cards are very consumer for focused. If you buy anything with your credit card and you don't like it, it's like, boom, you get your money back. So there's always that. So I find I, you know, for me, when I was really entering the space in the early years, it was like, this is never going to be used for payments. I kind of had this already in my head. I was like, this is never going to be used for payments. Uh, when I was at Bitcoin, um, uh, inside Bitcoins in New York, I did like a talk there and I said that and everybody was like in shock. It was like 2012, I think. And they were like, oh my God, what is she saying? This is going to, you know, and I was like, no, because the goal of Bitcoin kind of serves one party, but not the other. And at the end, the customer is always right, right? Like we, the yeah. customer dictates what they're going to do. So if the customers say, hey, I'm not going to pay with crypto, I'm going to pay my, with my credit card because I want that security. I want that um, liability protection and so forth. Then, I mean, the merchant has to offer that payment mode and that's it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where, you know, for me, I was always kind of in the camp of store of value. And that's why I was in the space. It was more like, well, um, you know, I'm seeing government's print money and I'm seeing, you know, a lot of stuff kind of happening that, hey, you know, we don't really know what's going to happen. So, um, I mean, that's that's the interesting thing on, on my end. I do want to see at some point, and maybe this is counter my business, but it would be interesting for crypto to be used for payments at some point. But I think in, in the state that it is right now with the fees, like you said, and just, you know, it's just people are seeing the asset appreciate so much that, it doesn't make sense to sell it and buy yourself a cup of coffee or, you know, something. It's like, well, if I keep it, I'll probably make 20% of my money in like three months. Why would I use it? Right. So until there's some stability, right. it's, it's a little bit, um, yeah. a point. It's right. I think if once everybody, when, once it really becomes common for people to own cryptocurrencies and they just have them in their wallets and, you know, they may just then decide to start spending it, especially if, you know, maybe even like using stable coins or something of the sort. Yeah. And then once you have payment channels that work well and scale well, you can do the same thing as well. So it's possible that once everybody has just has cryptocurrencies from investment or anything else, that they'll also have kind of a spending wallet and they'll think it's cool and it's all on their phone and it's easy to do and they don't have to worry about about uh, the credit card rejecting the payment for whatever reason. And, you know, perhaps that will happen. But at the same time, yeah, it doesn't seem to be something that that anybody is super focused on right now. Yeah, I think, I mean, there is something that's interesting, you know, what's happening now with like Google and Apple and the new do not track and, you know, GDPR in, in Europe, um, you know, privacy just in general starting to take most people don't realize what they're giving away when they're giving it away in terms of data. But as people mm -hmm. are starting to become a little bit smarter in terms of like, hey, I'm sharing a lot of stuff with like Facebook and Facebook knows too much about me and Google knows too much. And as we're kind of moving towards a non follow kind of you know, cookies disappearing and all that, I think people are going to start getting a little bit smarter in, you know, I don't want to give all this information. I want to pay cash for certain products or certain services and so forth. So maybe um, in, in, in the next 10 years, I think it's going to be pretty interesting to see and, um, you know, what's going to happen with, you know, just crypto in general and technology and so forth. But right now, if you have your, if you have crypto uh, for anybody listening, keep it don't buy cup, mm -hmm. uh, cups of coffee with it. <laughs> it would not be worth it. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, talking about, you know, owning crypto and buying crypto and, and kind of investing, um, just a, a very basic question. And again, this is just your personal advice. So for anybody listening, Zach is not recommending anything that you should be doing. Although Zach is like a super, you know, knowledgeable guy and an expert in the space. Uh, we're just kind of uh, shooting the shit here and, and, and talking about a couple of things. But if you, ha if you were new to the space, you just kind of came out of nowhere, you had a thousand thousand bucks um, and you wanted to invest, you wanted to kind of start getting in the crypto world, what would you do? What, were you, mm -hmm. what would be your first steps? The first step would to be to put it all into Bitcoin. So that would okay. be the first thing. Yes, it's the most stable one. And that's that's how you get your fit, feet wet and then start learning about it. And I would recommend even spending a bit of it and trying to see how it works. 
And to me, that's a big part of it because you don't want to buy Bitcoin and just leave it on an exchange. That's not, first of all, it's not the real Bitcoin experience, but it's also not its intended use case. It's not the way it's supposed to be used. It's supposed to be used as, as being your own bank. So you have your keys and that's the only way that you have your own coins. Okay. So making sure you really understand the security of it, how to handle it, and perhaps even how to teach others. And so that would be the first step. And then if you want to start getting more adventurous, if and when Bitcoin doubles, so the price doubles from the point that you first purchased it, then you could sell off 10% to Ethereum, for example. Okay. And so now you've already had certain profits off of Bitcoin, and now you can put 10% into Ethereum. And then you can do the same thing with Ethereum. When that doubles, put 10% into something a little bit riskier. Okay, so and this is a conservative approach. You would you would buy right. from the cons- okay. it's conser- Well, it's conservative to Bitcoin, not conservative to to fiat, right? Okay. Um, and then once in a while, you rebalance to make sure that, uh, like, if, if the super risky one, you know, goes times three hundred in that in that time period and becomes your biggest asset, then I would rebalance to have to still have Bitcoin as probably at least seventy percent or so, and and Ethereum as as the smaller percentage. Okay, so you're still so, you're still thinking that Bitcoin has more growth potential. I guess you're thinking hmm, this absolutely, is a wild yeah. prediction. Wild prediction, Zach. From this point up until it Bitcoin doubles, how long do you think that is? From now? Yeah. A few months, I would say. Wow. Okay. So that so then it's not it's not that much of a long term strategy what you're advocating because if you're saying it's going to double in a few months, then this can kind of go pretty quickly. I mean, yeah, we're 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 in the middle of the bull market now, so things happen quickly. It's it's the it's usually the bull market is usually pretty quick, um, especially the part where where the extreme exponential growth, and then at least from experience, what's happened so far that it cool there's have a cooling down period where it kind of it finds the bottom. And that yeah. can take, you know, anywhere between two to three years or, or that's what's been happening so far at least. Obviously okay. doesn't mean it will happen again. But as far as planning is concerned, that's the kind of things you can, you can start thinking about. And then of course, it's always good when in your, the best time to buy is always in, in the bear market, of course. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that you should, um, that, that there, first of all, you don't know that there's going to be another bear market. So you don't know anything. So if you're just starting as of right now, I would start with something and then build a plan around that. And the plan should have, what do I do when it goes up two, four, six times? And what should I do when it goes down two, four, six times? Okay. Interesting. So your, your best advice is basically get it all into BTC Mm-hmm. wait till it doubles and then start diversifying to ETH and kind of going from there. Um, let's right. say we get to that point. Somebody takes your advice to get to that point and they say, okay, Zach, what should I do next? Now that I bought my BTC, my ETH, how do I choose altcoins? Cause there's a million of them. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, there we've seen, you know, some, some of the smaller altcoins go up like 400 X in like three days. And then they just like, it's a wild ride. Right. So how, right. how do you, how, how would you personally judge what is worth a worthwhile altcoin to, to buy? And, mm-hmm. and what's the type of research or things that you look for when you, when you, when you look at an altcoin? Yeah. So first of all, I'm definitely conservative when it comes to cryptocurrency. I'm, I'm mostly on the Bitcoin side. I don't have a lot of experience with the crazy altcoins. Okay. And so anything I say isn't from experience investing in altcoins. But for me, the fundamentals are important. So first of all, I want to see what it does and I want to see how decentralized it is. And I want to see what the token itself does. And so if I'm looking at a currency that doesn't, that feels like it's, it's very centralized, then I won't be interested in it, even if I think it can go up a lot. So I, I really only care about seeing if something is, is useful over time. Everything else is just gambling. Now, you may be right on the gamble, but you might be wrong. So if you like gambling, there are a lot of ways to gamble. I mean, you can you can also leverage Bitcoin or Ethereum and, and try your luck there and, and, and might get hurt in a lot of ways. But yeah. if you're into gambling, that's also an option. And so and uh, the decentralized and centralized question is a big one and because that's the pretty much the whole reason that cryptocurrencies exist in the first place. It can basically, can they survive a state attack? Can the platform be destroyed 
And can the founders go to jail for it? And so that's kind of the question you have to ask yourself, because the only reason Bitcoin still exists is because states haven't been able to destroy it and put the founders in jail. And so, so far, that's been true about some of the other coins, but some of them are just so new and they're and they're very risky and there are a lot of them. And so if I think that there's a currency that offers a lot, but they don't understand the fundamentals of decentralization or of money, then I'm going to be wary of it and not going to be interested in, in investing in it. But if there's something they bring to the table that's very interesting, then I'll be more open minded and dig deeper and deeper. Would you say something like that would be like a specific use case? Like, you know, there's a lot of coins that are, you know, um, maybe for for gambling purposes. Um, there's, you know, there's specific, you know, there's the the coins that are, you know, to, for for any kind of adult material. You know, the adult entertainment industry just in general has been on, under attack um, mm-hmm. for good reasons and for bad reasons. You know, so, you know there's two ways of looking at it and there's some good and some bad, but you know, a lot of the adult actresses are now having a hard time getting paid um, because, you know, PayPal doesn't want to uh, support this industry. And then, you know, Stripe doesn't support it and the banks don't want to send wires and it's starting to become really messy. Whereas this is a legal, you know, quote unquote profession. Um, and you're allowed to do this on be a cam girl or do whatever you want. Uh, so there's some use cases for certain crypto that's, well, you know, this could be used for, you know, paying adult models, or this can be like, how do you feel about, I guess the better question is, how do you feel about these like very specific coins that, that, that kind of just respond to one need or one specific uh, use case? Well, I don't think you need a special coin for the adult industry. Like you can use Bitcoin or you can use any of the other slightly smaller coins that are, that have at least been around for a while if the fees are too high. I, you don't need a special, you don't need a special token, just to, it's just a payment in the end of the day, yeah. right? And then as far as, as far as the actual video, if they're being deplatformed, then I think there's definitely room for decentralized video, but that doesn't have to be a blockchain. That just has to be software that everybody shares. And, and so those are different technologies that, that does, don't necessarily require a token. Okay. And so why does that token exist? I think that it's, it's kind of the people, it's, at this point, it's, it's, there's so much hype around Bitcoin and blockchain that there are a lot of people trying to find, uh, well, it's trying to find a problem for their solution, basically. Yeah, I mean, it's it kind of comes down to the U.S. dollar versus other currencies. You know, at the end of the day, the U.S. dollar does what it's supposed to do. So when I'm trying to pay somebody, I'm in Canada, he's in Europe, this guy's there, whatever. It's like just send everybody U.S. dollars, kind of just get it done. So Bitcoin is, you know, it's not the U.S. dollar, but you know, anecdotally could mm-hmm. be seen as the USD of, right. of, of, of trading. So why would you need, you know, you might need the Canadian dollar here and there for a couple of transactions, but, you know, ultimately if you hold Bitcoin, you don't need everything else because everybody accepts, you know, the, the, the main currency. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Just kind of mm-hmm. going a little bit on that track and, and closing the loop on that, talking about investments and altcoins and so forth. What are, what are your thoughts on other, uh, you know, like crypto style investing, like NFTs and, and, you know, digital art and so forth like do you what are your just general thoughts on yeah nfts i'm still a little confused about i think it's uh, it's an interesting question about ownership and transferring ownership and and what that means really so i'm I'm trying to keep an open mind but i haven't figured out yet okay so so that's what i have to say about nfts i'm not (laughs) sure where it's going i haven't seen anything that's blown my mind yet but um but but i think that I mean, there's like digital art and then there's other things that re- can be represented digitally. And NFTs don't obviously only only have to be art. It could yeah. be like a specific gold bar, for example. It's anything that's non-fungible. Yeah. So it could be a specific gold bar from an authority that signs it. And the signature is an NFT. And then you can buy that and trade that with the bar. So, for example, that can be one thing. Um, perhaps one day in the future, real estate to an extent can be done that way. Of course, the problem with real estate is it's still, you know, you still have to go to the, the local municipalities and the governments and they have to recognize that as well. Or maybe yeah. you can sell it to two people. So I'm, I'm waiting to see what happens with that. I think it's interesting, but but I don't think it's really fully baked yet. Yeah, I mean, I think for NFTs, what scares me is that, you know, who's holding the NFT and selling the NFT and how secure is the location or let's say, um, 
you know, is it stored on some kind of server? Could the server go down? And then what happens to my asset? Mm -hmm. um, well, if that, it's the NFT, then then it's on the blockchain. So the the ownership is on the blockchain. Well, the transaction, yes, you know, the ownership is proven on the blockchain, but the actual right. asset, I'm talking about ah. the, the physical, well, no, I don't want to say physical when I'm not, yes. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to explain this, but like the, the picture, let's say you're buying art, right. the actual the, picture of the art is not on the blockchain. The transaction, right. and the ownership and the trading is on the blockchain, but the actual thing that you're buying, mm -hmm. which is not physical, but technically it is kind of physical. There is anyway, whatever I'm, I'm getting yeah, yeah. ahead of myself, but, um, that, I see what that, you're saying. That, that's what worries me is like, you know, that you have all these artists and, you know, I'm just talking about art just because it's like, it's the most current and the most widely, you know, a business case right now for NFTs, but there's other stuff as well. Um, it's just like how secure is where this artist is storing all this stuff? How do we know that this NFT is not just going to disappear when this person dies or, uh, you know, he, I don't know, he got hit by a bus or she got hit by a bus and, you know, nobody knows where this asset is stored. So when you do want to sell it, how is, you know, I just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of questions. I personally think that um, I'm kind of on the NFT train, at least on the art side. I feel like art, uh, when I was a kid, I used to collect like uh, hockey cards. It was a big thing here in Canada. And it was like, you know, mm -hmm. there was a lot of value in hockey cards. And I feel like NFTs just kind of remind me of that. So maybe, maybe it's all bullshit, but whatever. It just feels <laughs> like, I feel like there's something to it, you know, just cause there's there, people like collecting stuff. This is just another way of collecting stuff, right? So right. A collecting stuff. So the question is the scarcity if, if they do a good if the scarcity is done in a good way yeah and and That's i think the there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be figured out like how these things are stored and how secure they are and you know there's, there's a lot of stuff that we we're really at the you know like they say the hockey stick curve we're really at the really bottom 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 of all this stuff so i think we you know we're we're, mm -hmm. we're still worlds yeah. away so um, to me well, it, um, the more interesting part is actually what's happening with the decentralized exchanges right now and defi in general Okay. And that seems to really be taking off in numbers. Like there's tremendous amount of of use for decentralized exchanges where two, three years ago, people thought it was a joke and there was like nothing and no, that will, that will never happen. So of course we come, it comes back to the question is, are they sufficiently decentralized? And I, I think we will, I mean, with that kind of volume, we'll find out soon enough, but they keep on every time Every time there is a weakness, I feel that these guys are able to like the, the different developers are able to fix it. And there's so many different ones right now that it just seems to be really speeding towards um, any improvement that they'll have to do in order to become sufficiently decentralized. And we already see that there are a lot fewer hacks than we did years ago. So years ago, there were hacks on these smart contracts all of the time. Yeah. And now there are way more smart contracts out there and fewer hacks, which is a big thing to notice. And so when you see that you have developers who could be from all over the world, all ages, genders, working on this stuff because they're highly incentivized to do this versus the speed in which governments work, which is, you know, not very fast. What, was, what did Lagarde <laughs> from the ECB say? Hopefully we'll have we're working diligently on an on a European digital currency that we'll have in four years, which you know will be eight years <laughs> and think of where all of this will be in, in two years. Yeah. So so it's on a completely different level of, of software development and project development. And that's what excites me. The idea that um, this whole finance will really eat up the old finance because it's just better and it moves faster and and everybody has access to it immediately without having to apply for anything. Well, it's, it's a little bit of wealth distribution, I guess, once we start getting to the point where, um, you know, there's more trade and it's, it's starting to kind of become a trading mechanism. Um, you know, if I want to buy a scarf from a woman that makes them in Africa, well, great. Now I can do it really easily as the current system stands. And, you know, we get a lot of leads on, on direct payment from people in emerging markets because we write a lot of different blogs and it kind of appeals to different people. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, we can't help people in Africa, which really stinks because, you know, these are legitimate people who want to start a business, get their families out of poverty, get, you know, get something going. And mm -hmm. they're, they're literally just blocked. They just cannot right. get a merchant account. Yeah. They could get a merchant account in Africa, which is going to convert like shit for American uh, buyers and Canadian buyers, which is where they want to sell. So it, it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, uh, 
it, you know, I guess I, I don't want to be super um, altruistic here, but, you know, why not give everybody a fair shot to, to, to succeed, you know, and this is mm, almost absolutely. giving everybody a fair shot, right? Because everybody can right. buy whatever they want from whoever they want. So, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, for whatever reason, free markets have gotten a bad rap. And people see it as, you know, capitalist pigs, but it's really just an extension of freedom of speech and freedom of expression where there's a way somebody wants to live their life life without hurting anybody else. And all there are all these things in their way saying, no, you can't do this because of this reason. No, you can't do this because of that reason. And eventually that leads people to having given in into whatever cube they're forced to, to be into. And that causes more poverty. And so by using cryptocurrencies, what you're doing is you're basically enforcing the free market. And you're saying, well, now you have those options. You can step out of that cube and and all of a sudden you have these options where you can choose what you want to do, who you want to sell to and who you want to buy from. And so I think that's that's really a tremendous amount of power, of power for everyone in the world really to enjoy cryptocurrencies. It's it's equally available to everyone. And that's that's what's special about it. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's gonna just because of the, you know, there's a lot of bad things that that happen. uh, And there's a lot of good things, but just like the internet, right, it brought some good, it brought some bad. So this is ultimately for the 99% of humanity going to be good. And then there's obviously going to be used. So we only hear about the bad stuff that's ever happened. And uh, I mean, we've Mm -hmm. been, I think you and I've been around uh, long enough in this space, we we've been through the Silk Roads and the Mount Goxes and all the 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 bad stuff that kind of happened in the early days that really scared people but on the positive side is that you know because government moves so slow um it gave bitcoin almost like oxygen to be able to to keep growing and blockchain to keep growing because governments just didn't know what the hell they what this is like what do we do with this i remember you know the first couple of shows um that i had gone there were some some government officials there and they were like completely like out of their element they were like what is this like you know and they were trying mm-hmm. to learn uh but you know they were already you know five years behind everybody else that was already uh you know buying crypto and, and trading and stuff like that so i mean the government moving slow is actually a good thing i think for for crypto because it's giving it you know life yeah, it a little bit and and just like the internet you know at the beginning stages of the internet it was you know because they didn't know how to regulate stuff because they didn't know it just gave so much um, time for it to grow. And then obviously we kind of got, you know, a, a few rules and things uh, going. So, I mean, it's, uh, I'm, I'm very Cookies. interested to Cookie see. Rolls. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm very interested to see what's going to happen. I'm actually uh, really excited to, you know, obviously that we spoke and that you talked about our, about your ATMs, but what do you see for the future of Lamasu? Like for the next couple of years, what are you guys working on? Uh, where do you see the mm-hmm. company going? Yeah, so we're working on a few things. One of the things we're working on is, is always new models to fit the market that, that exists now. One of, them, one of the machines we're working on is, is a larger model that will be able to, to accept a much larger amount of bills and very quickly. Wow. Um, but the most important thing is really getting these machines out to all, especially the markets where, where, they, where we don't have any form of saturation right now. And so... Um, Europe needs a lot of work, and we're hoping to to work with operators to get more machines into Germany and France and and really the rest of Europe. And there is, of course, all of Asia and, and emerging markets as well. So we want to get Bitcoin ATMs everywhere in the world. While at the same time, I still think that there's there are um, really huge opportunities still in North America. I mean. Bitcoin ATMs are growing at a very fast pace right now, but there is still a lot of room for for this growth. And especially if everybody starts using using Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, you're going to have a lot more demand, just like you currently have a lot of demand for legacy ATMs all around. So people are going to want to convert cash to crypto and back. And so it's very important for us to be anywhere available, anywhere with with machines at different price points as well. Yeah. And, and I mean, the and interesting then, thing, it's not just Bitcoin, right? We're calling them Bitcoin ATMs, but technically operators right. can decide to to sell a whole bunch of different coins. So it's exactly. just, it, we'll so call we, them crypto right. ATMs. Crypto ATMs. Yes. Yeah. We currently have six uh, options for six different currencies and, and we're adding more, including stable coins at this point. Oh, wow. Even stable coins. Nice. Yes. Cool. Yes. And um, how many how many ATMs do you have uh, in North America? In North America, at this point, we have, if I'm not mistaken, about 
300 to 400 machines. Oh, wow. Okay. And that's mainly in the big cities like, you know, New York, LA, Vegas, all that kind of stuff, or is it just pretty much peppered around North America? Uh, There's a little bit of peppering around. Most of them are in, are in the bigger cities. Um, in Canada, we have a lot in, in Montreal and Toronto. Yeah. Uh, we have machines in Las Vegas, so they, they are they are popping up and around. But but right now it really is a, mostly the the larger cities. So tell 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 our listeners how would somebody go about finding a Bitcoin ATM to buy some some crypto? So the the best site for finding Bitcoin ATMs is CoinATMRadar.com. Okay. And of course, you want to look for Lamassu machines since they're the yes. easiest to use. <laughs> um, but if there aren't any, you can use a competitor as well. And uh, that's the easiest way for finding a Bitcoin ATM wherever you are. And then it's also very helpful because it tells you which ones are online. So if any of them are having technical issues, it'll tell you that as well. Okay, great. So we'll put that in the show notes, uh, coinatmradar.com. Um, and Zach, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. This was a really interesting conversation. And I like the the one thing I'm going to say to 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 our listeners is um, we've had a couple of people talk about Bitcoin and I've talked about Bitcoin and crypto. And it seems like um, you almost put the... Uh, the conservative hat on it, which I really like. There's a lot of people that are just kind of, you know, all over the place. So I'm really happy that we had your opinion and, and we had your, your, uh, you know, the, just your investment ideas, we'll call them. Um, and thank you so much. And we'll have some, some uh, notes on how to get in touch with Zach and his company and so forth on the show notes. So thank you so much, Zach, for all your time and have yourself a great day. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. For, thank you for having me. Hope you found today's session valuable. If you have any questions for me or just want to connect, please feel free to visit my website, mariasparagis.com. That's M-A-R-I-A-S-P-A-R-A-G-I-S.com. I'd love to hear what you're working on. So drop me a line on any hot button issues your business is experiencing. And remember, don't worry about failure. You only have to be right once.